So now let's uh, apply this to a service set. Right? So it's it's different in, in many important ways. So that's what I want to work through, right? So if you think about a service process, and this could be anything from approving a, a, a mortgage loan to treating a patient to performing surgery, anything that involves a service loan. There are three metrics that matter. The unit cost, the cycle time, and the error rate. Okay, those are the three metrics that matter. Now, the nuances in any one situation, the cost could be total cost, labor cost, machine cost, including benefits, including temps. You could flavor it however you want it. But the three kind of genres of costs, of uh, metrics, are cost time and error rate. Deliberately error rate because the idea is going in on all of them is good. Okay? So let me put forward a few kind of guiding principles. First is, that's it. Those are the only three metrics you need. Okay, time, cost, and quality. Any service process, anywhere, can be measured on just those three metrics. That's one. Second is, the notion that there is a trade-off is a false notion between any of the two. Okay? Simultaneous improvement across all three dimensions is possible. At some point, a service process will deliver in zero time, at zero cost, or 100% quality, getting near you know, perfection on all of them, getting slightly better on any of them may require trade-offs. No service process is even remotely close to that uh, anyway. So this concept of a trade-off uh, doesn't apply. So where do you start? Most people run improved service processes start at cost. That's exactly the wrong place to start. Service processes are 60 or 70 percent labor. If you want to improve the cost of a service process, the only way to do that is to take people out. Either less overtime, fewer shifts, fewer people, lower skill, lower pay, whatever you want. One way or the other, you're taking intellectual people capacity out of the equation. The only thing that happens when you do that is the error rate starts to climb and the cycle time starts to climb because now fewer people are left with a bigger workload of stuff they don't understand. They're going to make mistakes, so we're going to keep referring to experts, pulling them in. So while you succeeded in pushing the water balloon in at that point, it pops out of the other two points and you're worse off than you were before. Usually when people do this, they get promoted and move away because they took 20% of the cost out of the system. And by the time it catches up with them, they're two jobs and three divisions away. The next thing, error reduction is also exactly the wrong place to start. Uh, that's counterintuitive because most people think quality circles, etc., etc. In a process that's fundamentally the same, the only way you improve error is to inspect. So then you have checkers, then you have checkers who check the checkers, and then checkers who check the checkers who check the checkers. And then what happens with that is one, you put in layers and layers of cost. You put in layers and layers of delay because one of those guys is on vacation along the checking chain and therefore nothing moves forward. And again, you succeeded exactly in pushing the error rate in, the other two pop out. And again, there's often a delay. The president's quality circle, the medals are given, the awards are handed up, but they've not really solved the problem. So now I'm going to the three dimensions, and two of them are exactly the wrong place to start. Turns out it's not hard to figure out what the right place to start is. And so cycle time is the only place to start to improve, uh, 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 in, in to, to improve a service process. Why is that? It will eliminate handoffs. Because if you try and get something done in as quick as time as possible, you don't have the luxury of handing it off to other people. You don't have the luxury of tolerating errors coming in because you don't have time to fix other people handing you shorty work. So it forces you to confront it and say, guys, I expect a certain level of quality out of this because I can't get my job done. And so this notion of time-based service competition unlocks the most value because it's the only metric when you put it in, it drags the others in instead of pushing them on. Because the only way you can push time in is to actually reduce the cost and reduce the error. Right. So take, for example, 10 years ago, mortgage processing. If you define the cycle time as I apply for a loan and I have the money from the bank in my bank account, they were happy with a 45 day loan. Why? Because Happy people don't move that often and it takes two months to move into a house anyway, the closest two months out, so it's fine. So everybody was comfortable with the 45 day processing step. If you dig into it, what is required for a bank to approve a mortgage loan for you? Verify your income, that takes 10 seconds. Verify your pay stuff, that takes 5 seconds. Verify the title, that's a minute. You, you'd be hard pressed 
to create more than six hours of work, including physically inspecting the house. So why does six hours of work take 45 days? Because it could. And so they would play volleyball between the front office and the back office where the form wasn't, wasn't correct, we didn't get the supply, the social security number, we didn't get a pay stub, this didn't get a pass, that didn't get a match. And 38 days later, there'd be some heroic time and catches and the loan would come through. Along comes Intuit and Quicken and they give you mortgage loans in seven days. What happens to all these banks? Caught flat footed because they cannot fix the process fast enough. And in the process of fixing it fast enough, drop the ball on quality, drop the ball on certification, and end up creating a bunch of movies they probably should not have created. So in general, even if it makes no sense for you to have a one-day turnaround on a mortgage loan, the act of thinking, what do I have to do to make it a one-day process, forces it to get much better. Now having done that, you might say seven days is good enough. Great, that's fine. But the notion of lean being zero dollar, go all the way to zero and then work your way back up. Uh, similarly, uh, as you do for waste, is the key. Okay. So what happens? Why is this? So, what? so if you took this notion of some metrics are visible and some metrics are not, manufacturing inventory is very visible. So let me give you an example. Imagine um, we're in the business of manufacturing this pen, and I'm running a manufacturing plant out in the middle of uh, the movies. And you guys are all at headquarters. And every time you place an order for 10,000 pens, it's there. The next week you place an order for 20,000 different cups, it's there. So you're talking to yourself and saying, well, small and bad runs a very efficient manufacturing plant. We should organize a best practice visit. So all of you get together, organize a best practice visit to come and see my plant. Actually, they're running a crappy good. The yields are 20%, the supplies are never on time, the parts are unreliable, the machine's always broken down, my workforce doesn't show up. In short, I'm running the worst possible manufacturing plant in the world. But I've got a Walmart-sized inventory of every pen, of every size, and every color. So whatever you ask for, I'm shipping it to you the same thing. And so you got fooled into thinking I was running an efficient manufacturing operation, when really I was just hoarding the inventory. So as you look at this, you say, you know what we're going to do, guys? I'm going to take away your inventory. And you know, I know you ship in one day. I'll give you two days. Don't worry about it. The next time you place an order, what do you think the chances are that I'm going to meet the order? Zero. Why? Because under that, I'm crappy at forecast accuracy, supply quality, schedule compliance, production quality, equipment utilization. I'm horrible at all of those. I was allowing inventory to mask my underlying problems. That's the manufacturing world. Go to a service <coughs> world, and you've got cycle time. The bank example I told you was hiding all the shoddy things underneath it. Underneath this, if you go, Staff availability, pre-work accuracy, incomplete orders, equipment, on-time performance, all of those are potentially broken, right? But because they all are errors under the water surface, the thing that shows up is end-to-end -end cycle. So if you just said, as an extreme, from the time a patient walks in the door to the time they walk out the door, okay, we want no more than 10 minutes outside of the physician's engagement with them. That's it. So the physician needs to spend 20 minutes on a procedure, and to end 30 minutes. If the physician needs to spend an hour on a procedure, 70 minutes. If you did that, it would show you all of the things that are so broken in the process that that makes that act impossible to achieve. Right? So think of it like you're draining the water level in the bay. When you drain the water level in the bay, you know which rocks you want to protect. When the water level is high enough, everything goes by, and the rocks live happily ever after under the water. So once you accept that it's okay for a patient, so you go to the next page, right? Take a typical clinic visit through the time lens. The world is accepting that there's a 60 minute go to go from the time I come into the time I leave. Now let's talk about value adding time, where there's a touch between somebody on the team and the patient. Arrivals, so the 15 minute window, it took 30 seconds to type that in the computer. So the red is the value added work, the top is the elapsed time. As you go through this, you see, 60 minutes of elapsed time, this is a very routine thing, so the provider spent five minutes of them, let's say. 60 minutes elapsed, but only 10 minutes of value added. So it's only about 17% of the elapsed time was value added. The rest of it was waste uh, on top of it, right? So what happens here, when you look through this lens, when you look through the lens, you can easily take 30 to 50% of the end to end cycle time. That's not that hard to do. And when you do that, it ends up either increasing capacity by 10 to 25% or reducing the cost of service. 
And the key insight from this is the following. Is when you look through a time lens, you expose all the places where it occurs. The leverage, and this is the counterintuitive part. This is not about cracking the whip and making anyone do their task faster. Doesn't matter. That's like trying to make the red a little thinner. The, the key is the non-value added tasks to go away. So the stuff between tasks is where to focus, not the tasks. So it's a bit like, you know, in a zebra pattern, right? Is it a white stripes on a black animal or is it black stripes on a white animal? It's kind of what are you looking at? So in the same way, You've got to focus on the gaps. Most service processes are less than 10 to 20% value added. Manufacturing processes are 70 to 80% value added. That's not an indictment. It's just the nature of the beast. Service processes are highly variable. Every patient is different. Every provider is different. Every provider's interaction with every patient is different. Every day is different. And so when you've got such high variability, it's difficult to have a 90% utilization. Okay? So that's kind of how you so, the only level you've got then is a synchronization. So remember when we talked about waste variability and flexibility? The flexibility part is how you synchronize demand and supply. So what you have to do is get a handle of the demand pattern in service processes, and you've got to do it in very fine level granularity. Most folks analyzing demand in the service context take macro. How many patient visits a day? How many patient visits a week, a month? That's the equivalent of saying my head's in the freezer, my feet are in the oven, but on average I'm at a very comfortable temperature. It doesn't work. When you average at a macro level, it just doesn't work. So you need fine-grained analysis of the demand pattern to forecast it and then to shape it. And you can shape the demand curve far more than people think you can. Most people accept the demand curve as a God-given thing, that's the way I got the demand and that's what I got. Turns out you can shape it. So post 9-11, we got to rework Atlanta Airport because it was taking four hours to go through security. And when it takes four hours to go through security, people don't take one hour flights. They drive four hours because it makes no sense to go four hours of security for a one hour flight. And uh, major airports are run by the airline that's the hub. So Delta runs Atlanta Airport. <coughs> if suddenly people stop taking short flights, the entire economics of the network of the connecting flight and the long distance hub goes away. So they were understandably quite panicked about. So now you've got no control over the process. The National Guard is running it, so you can't say, guys, you know, let's lighten up on the screening. You can't touch the process. The process is the process. Very similar to healthcare. You're not going to go into a surgeon and try and tell them how they should be doing their surgery differently. So you just say, okay, that's what you do. You got it. Right? So you've got to control that. You can try, but this is what happens, right? So what you can do is you can shape the demand. So you dig into what is the arrival time of all of these passengers in the air? Well, it turns out once everyone knows it takes four hours, what do you do? You go five hours before, right? If you're nervous, uh, nervous five, you go six hours before. So now all the people who came three hours before their flight are missing their flight because they're people who came five hours before who are blocking them. So one little way to fix the demand curve was to just put in a step as they entered the line to look at the boarding pass and look at your watch and say, it's more than two hours away from your flight. They're not letting you enter the line. Go get a coffee, go for a walk, sit somewhere. They don't even enter the system. So once they did that, suddenly it became useless to go to the airport five hours in advance because you know the moment you walk into the back of the line, you're going to get kicked out, you're going to chill somewhere for three hours and come back. You might as well show up two hours before flight. So that took the edge of the demand curve off sufficiently to make the process get started better. Right? Now of course you've got to do other things, but this is just an indication of how you can shape the demand. Another example which uh, was a lot of fun for us, we were working with one of the best paper mills in the country and the way, I don't know if you've seen paper getting made, but wood chips come in and you've got to run the chips through digesters and uh, bleach them and do all of this and make fibers and make paper. The guys who deliver wood chips are very tricky guys. They put tires under the wood chips, they put rocks, they raise the weight of their container in sneaky ways. And of course, if you just trust them and unload into your chemical equipment, bad things happen. So it became a game of gotcha. You've got to put a tester to drop into the pile and measure moisture, measure lignin, measure all these things. The problem is this testers cost 250000 bucks, and the line of trucks was around the plant. So the business case was four new testers, $1 million, it'll improve our quality, we'll have less of these hazardous events, etc. Et the business case was flowing just perfectly. We looked at the demand analysis and said, what do we have to believe? How many trucks do I have to fool into coming two hours earlier or two hours later for this not to be a problem? If it's 90% of the trucks have to be fooled, then yeah, I might have buy the testers. 
Bill's arm was less than 30% of the trucks had to be fooled into coming two hours earlier or two hours later. So the solution was 20 bucks a day, free donuts and coffee, and a big poster board that said, free donuts and coffee, 7 a.m. hanging. That's it. And when they're gone, they're gone. So what does this do? Enough of the truckers on the second day after they saw that said, oh, I got it, I'm gonna go there earlier or I'm gonna go there later, because it turns out these big trucks are difficult to pick through the McDonald's drive. So these guys were not getting their coffee in the morning, and this was perfectly fine. So the workflow was the plant administrative assistant walked across the street to Dunkin' Donuts for a big old thing of coffee, big box of donuts, twice a day. No, no million dollars in testing. So you can shape the demand. That's that's not clear we do that for all ecology, but you can shape the demand. So that's one. Second on the supply side, you take the supply and start to say, what are the nurses, what are the assets, and then how do I wrap them up in the right way? Right? How do I wrap them up so that it matches? So what you're doing is you're looking at the demand pattern. The, the closer you can mirror the demand pattern with your capacity, the better off you recognizing that the demand pattern is choppy and the capacity, you can't give people 15 minute shifts, right? And then people show up to work and therefore it counts. So you're, you're trying to match a series of square lines with a squiggly thing, but as best as you can get it. And the way you get it as good as you can is that's where the crazy math comes in. If you took the crazy math and started to forecast very, very accurately at the right level of granularity, so an infusion forecast on a Monday, how many patients am I going to get of what mix? How many one hours, how many two hours, how many four hours? That's the right level of granularity. So the trick is, you have to forecast the right level of granularity. You have to translate the resource rules, and from that, build the optimization that synchronizes. Because the closer you synchronize the demand signal with the supply delivery, everything moves more smoothly through the system. Does that make sense?